It's been one year since John Lee took office as chief executive of Hong Kong. Congratulations. The former Korea police officer and security chief was tasked in 2022 with returning the city to stability and prosperity after the previous years of political turmoil, as well as the economic and social ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic. How much has he achieved so far? Is he on the right track? All the decisions are made uh, for the overall good of Hong Kong. We have to continuously sow hopes and confidence. And what about including everyone in his vision of building a happy Hong Kong after the anti-government protest violence that almost destroyed the city in 2019? We can forgive, but we cannot forget. This is Talking Post, and here's John Lee, ready to start a second year full of challenges. Chief Executive, thank you very much for joining us. I met you exactly a year ago, and uh, we were both wearing masks at that time, I remember. I couldn't really read your face, I can now. It's been a year. How has it been? How do you rate your performance so far? You set yourself some pretty uh, hard goals, results oriented. What's the progress report? How have you done? This year is a very busy year, but is fulfilling, and I think uh, the responsibilities that I need to discharge are very meaningful and significant to the people of Hong Kong, considering all the pros and cons, and how, despite uh, all the good intentions of any policies, then the cause of uh, achieving or carrying out those policies, uh, if there are things we need to mitigate uh, the, uh, the cause or the downside, then we do our best. And we should really explain to people uh, why we do it and why we do it in that way and uh, how we are addressing uh, the uh, different areas uh, despite there may be costs that uh, society uh, need to pay. But all the decisions are made uh, for the overall good of Hong Kong. Of all the initiatives you've taken so far, of all the uh, achievements that you have accomplished so far, is there anything that stands out? Is there anything that you would hold out to say, look, I got this done well, in my I'm, first year? Yeah, I'm, I, of course, am most pleased. And I think society as a whole uh, is most pleased with the resumption uh, of normal travel with mainland and also our connectivity with the world. Uh, it was a thing that everybody has gone through very negatively because COVID basically uh, disallowed a lot of activities that we would have gone about. It devastated the economy as well. And uh, psychologically as well. Um, and at that time, I think the biggest challenge is, of course, taking societies ahead to a direction that we continue to have hope and the belief that we will uh, get over it. And so during the whole process of uh, leading the whole of Hong Kong to go along the direction and also going through this tunnel, uh, we have to continuously so hopes and confidence. I think that is an important part. But the charge now is, uh, after we have gone out of the tunnel, is how do we, to ensure that we go ahead fast and we bring economic activities to return, commercial businesses and livelihood back to uh, what we want to be. Uh, so I'm very um, emphatic of the need of uh, creating new opportunities capitalizing on the strength of Hong Kong to ensure that we get the best return in the shortest period of time. Capacity building is one thing, and you see that uh, we have to rely heavily on two engines of growth. Uh, one is consumption, and the other is uh, tourism. But capacity building is important uh, for tourism to really come back to that 100% capacity, and even more than the usual 100%, because we need to strengthen and build it even stronger. But so far, I think even people in the tourism industries uh, feel that they have been building the capacity at a pace uh, faster than expected. And I think that's thanks to the general commitment 
and unity of belief that we need to really work hard together now because we have lost three years. And uh, that uh, sense of unity and commitment, I think, it is a very positive thing uh, that I think I will certainly capitalize on and uh, society can also capitalize on. Um, so I am uh, cautiously optimistic about Hong Kong. Cautiously because external environment is still not very good. Uh, we know that the import and export figures are still down. But uh, there are two positive factors I think uh, one can um, bear in mind so that we can continue uh, to work hard with confidence. First of all, uh, for example, in the uh, meeting uh, that China just had, what we call the Summer Davos, then there are indications that the second quarter figures for uh, Chinese economy uh, will be better than the first quarter. The first, figure, first quarter figures were not encouraging at all. Yeah, but the second quarter will be better. And also, uh, when new measures are rolled out, it takes time for them to really uh, get into place and have uh, the effects realized. That also happens to Hong Kong because we think the third quarter uh, will be a better quarter than the second quarter as well. Also, investments, I think, uh, are picking up because that, that is not just government investment. A lot of uh, government works program uh, have received positive uh, endorsement by LegCo, and so we are pushing out a lot of housing projects and road projects, infrastructure projects, so that will help government investment. And uh, there are signs that uh, private investment uh, is also coming back, uh, of course. Uh, not at a fast pace, but all these things add together, plus the, the strategies and national plans that give Hong Kong the extra opportunities uh, is something that uh, we should always grab, make good use of. The 14 5 year plan, the GVA development, and the and Belt and Road Initiative. These are the things that I emphasize on the importance of grabbing every opportunity that it, it, it produces. And I think so far so good because um, Hong Kong is a unique city which, as I've always described, that the national uh, strategies or the advantages and the international advantages that, that we get converge in one single city. So that means we get the beauty of the national strategies, we get those benefits, and at the same time we can capitalize on the opportunities that uh, we face uh, to the whole world. I mean, the Middle East countries are a good example. Right? I made my visit uh, in February to Saudi Arabia and UAE. The results, I think, uh, was quite positive. Um, first it's, of all, it's one thing to be talking to uh, people in the Middle East, but uh, you know they're cold and calculating as well when it comes to what's what's in it for us. So Absolutely. are we going to have solid business deals with them where you can actually see the tangible benefits in the city? Well, indeed, uh, I let over 30 uh, leaders, uh, business leaders, professionals to go with me to the Middle East in February. I've heard that at least uh, in four areas they were closing, they are about to close deals, close on deals. Uh, that includes uh, hotel, that includes application of IT to city management, to also uh, architecture uh, work. So th you, you are seeing positive results. The visits to the Middle East is part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So a visit to a country, of course, is not just to go and shake hands, it's to ensure that the government strategies of both places converge, connect. And the second thing is connecting um, trade, trade not just in goods, but in services. That's why I've brought a lot of uh, professionals to go with me. And the closing on deals include application of uh, IT to city planning, this and that. So that's professional service. And then it is also to connect money. Uh, we will go to invest in the, in, in, in the places we visit and we, we will invite and we, we think we are attracting money from the Middle East countries to come to Hong Kong. Okay, Chief Executive, that's all well and good. Now, you uh, mentioned uh, the importance of Hong Kong as an international city. 
and uh, the importance of investors whom yes. you're reaching out to, like you are in the Middle East. Mm. Uh, you do realize that uh, everything here hinges on their confidence in Hong Kong's one country, uh, two systems policy. Now, uh, this is a reflection of what we hear from business leaders, from politicians, everyone outside Hong Kong. You may be preaching to the choir here in Hong Kong in terms of our, uh, how things have improved, but uh, when they look at Hong Kong uh, and one country, two systems, they feel there is an overemphasis on one country over two systems. Now, nobody is disputing the importance of one country, but the importance of two systems is just as important for international investors because they want to uh, capitalize on Hong Kong being a unique city uh, in, in China, very different from the rest of China, free flow of information, capital, uh, independent judiciary and all that. How are you going to convince them? I know you've been reaching out, uh, you've done a lot of publicity, but this kind of uh, doubt remains. And, that, and these doubts will proliferate and uh, th this will prevent people from actually coming in. Well, I know what you say and what you mean. Uh, that is exactly we need to reach out and tell people that Hong Kong remains as what basic law says. Basic law, after its promulgation, it remains as it, it, as it is. No word is changed. So all the rights and freedoms are preserved. Uh, but we are living in a real world, not a world we, want to, we just want it to be. And the real world is that there are countries who are uh, targeting our country uh, in, these, uh, in this political relationship. Uh, and we know that uh, certain countries try to, uh, in another way, uh, not just through their policies uh, to attack uh, our own country uh, for our economic development, they are uh, making uh, all, all these uh, attacks uh, for political reasons. So this is a contest we are living in. So we have to work hard to first of all show other people that, well, what has been describing is not correct. We'll be bold about uh, what we are doing. Uh, we'll, of course, be presenting them with uh, good evidence. And more importantly, uh, seeing is believing. So what, what we are doing now is inviting people to come to Hong Kong so that they can see for themselves. And for those people who have come to Hong Kong to see for themselves, th and they know Hong Kong is exactly what the basic law describes as it is. Uh, you go about your normal duty and there is basically uh, no restriction other than the fact that you can't break the law and that applies to any place around the world. Um, there are of course a lot of bad mouthing about our Hong Kong national security law, but one thing they don't realize is uh, for the four types of offenses that we talk about, the first three types all talk about mens rea, intention. So you, you cannot in any way unwittingly contour in those offences because you don't have the intention. The court will, of course, not convict you. And we won't prosecute because there's no mens rea, no, no intention. So that, and that is true for subversions, for secession, and for terrorist activities. You have to have the intention. It's stated in the law with the intention, with the intent. For the other, for the third thing, which collision to uh, endanger national security, it's not just collusion, it's not just uh, getting uh, to talk to people or having some uh, joint uh, commitment, it's also to endanger national security. And that national endanger national security acts only cover five acts, not, not outside those five acts, right? So there's no six acts which will be regarded as collusion to endanger. And what are those five acts? You won't unwittingly commit it. First of all, is to, uh, to stage a war against us. You won't do it unwittingly. Or to uh, sanction us. You won't do it un unwittingly. Uh, or to manipulate uh, election. You won't un un unwittingly do it. Uh, you, you will have uh, in regard to the two others, 
seriously interfering with the execution of duties of the government with another important factor is which result in serious uh, damages, double serious. So you, you won't be able to do it unwittingly. And the last thing is you lose, you lose unlawful uh, measures to uh, cause serious damage uh, to society. And again, it's unlawful measures to, to result in serious consequences. So it's only those five things. So th I, I think a lot of people really haven't really looked at the ordinance uh, very clearly. And, and one other very important th thing is, in looking at all these things, the beginning chapter says that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, on Economic, uh, Social and uh, Society, uh, ESC, uh, Social and Cultural Rights, these two international covenants apply. That means for any application of the law, we have to conform with the international standard, which are the two international covenants. And who are the enforcer of uh, the human rights? The court. And you know our judicial um, has been highly regarded around the world. It's still very independent. That's a fact. Well, it's not just in independent. It is the only system which has non-Hong Kong judges sitting on a court of final appeal. No jurisdiction, no countries does that. Hong Kong is the only city that allows overseas judges to sit out on a, on a court of final appeal. Why do we do that? Because we're confident, we're transparent, and we, we're doing what we, we practice. Some of them are pulling out. Yeah, some of them pulled out, and uh, I'm, I regret that um, they make bad decisions, and I have heard stories that um, they are political pressures. But we still, we still have over 10 judges uh, from overseas, very reputable, very respectable judges, uh, who, who are now on a bench. And they are the enforcers, right? Chief Executive, you, you do realize that people look at this as, uh, uh, take the analogy of a pendulum, right? So uh, the swinging of the pendulum in the middle is the optimum uh, position it should be. What happened in 2019 with the riots and the violence and the uh, mm. subversion and all that nonsense that went on, the, the pendulum was swinging too much in one direction. So I can understand the steps you've taken to correct that and bring it to a, a more reasonable level where you know we are part of China, one country, two systems. But the danger is that it's swinging too much to the other direction where uh, you know, Hong Kong and people feel that Hong Kong is in danger of losing its identity because well, it's swinging too much. Well, I think uh, we can forgive, but we cannot forget. We cannot, cannot forget the risks. I think it's human nature that once we got through it and we get a little bit relaxed, but it's only when, say, if you don't keep yourself in good health, you only regret it when the disease hits you again. Well, that's why I always try to keep myself fit. Uh, but I think uh, it is important for the government to always bear history in mind, because uh, I think risk can come all of a sudden. You need to be prepared. And by being prepared, it means you need to also be aware of the negative forces, negative factors, uh, if they are still working, and, and what, uh, how are they working. Uh, already, I'm seeing some uh, soft resistance in, uh, in different ways to try to uh, cause destruction. Uh, you look at the... Um, organ donation, <coughs> um, sabotage, <coughs> then I can respect people's opinion about how they look at a particular system. But trying to create a false image that this uh, is a problem of that important scale, that great scale, using uh, force and even sometimes uh, unlawful uh, ways to do it, uh, is a sign of sabotage. It's not a sign of uh, I exercising my right. The person has not even uh, known that uh, 
his rights has been infringed because somebody some just acted as, as uh, on his behalf without his knowledge and do it. And so the police have taken action and, and I, I, I think uh, they will be working hard to get that evidence. So we'll, I hope we'll see um, the decision uh, eventually uh, through uh, the police investigation. But sabotage means what? Sabotage means going beyond uh, what is uh, rational, going beyond what is right, and uh, creating uh, big differences, even though uh, they are not they are not just uh, they they are not like that. As simple as that. And that reminds me of uh, the tactics and the practices they made use of during the 2019 uh, violence. So I, I need to uh, be alert to those counter forces that are working uh, beneath the surface, and we have to be to be to be careful. Uh, yeah, the organ donation uh, uh, reference you just made, uh, for the benefit of our viewers, is because uh, Hong Kong has a shortage of uh, organ donations, organ donors, and uh, uh, you, with all good intention, wanted to connect with the mainland uh, organ donation register so that uh, we can have uh, exchanges. And we've saved uh, babies' lives doing that, right? And uh, the, uh, the sabotage that you're talking about is people who are actually pulling out of it, or even when they were not registered, making it sound like you have pulled out of it because uh, the mainland organs are not reliable, that kind of stuff. So you do realize, we go back to what you talked about, which is you can forgive, but you can't forget. So. I'm glad you haven't forgotten that uh, the many, many people who are unhappy. Now, I'm not talking about, and I won't condone the violence that went on in the streets, and I won't make any excuse for it, but the many, many people who took to the streets with their grievances or with their concerns, those people never went away. They're, they're at home. They're sitting at home, and many of them are still resentful, and that resentfulness manifests in ugly ways, like with this organ donation uh, situation. Now, when you talk about forgiving but not forgetting, is the solution to condemn them, to uh, punish the ones who break the law? Okay, there is a law, those who break the law will be punished. But isn't there something that you can do to include them in this whole happy Hong Kong uh, campaign uh, that you've launched? Because end of the day, charity begins at home. You need to have Hong Kong people to be happy. You talked about partnering with Hong Kong people, to have partnerships, to have uh, the entire public supporting what you're doing. And there are many people. There are a large section of society does support you, but there is still a large section that does not. How are you going to deal with this? Because it's there, and it keeps manifesting every time, and, and sometimes in very ugly ways. Well, first of all, I don't differentiate anymore. I only differentiate people who have broken the law who hasn't, how they uh, think of the government, and how they have their I ideologies. It's something that <coughs> I think they have uh, their own choice to make. So I don't differentiate. Whatever I do now, I don't even talk about these things. I never do now. And that is what I mean. I, I do forgive. But it is important that societies don't forget. And I'm doing everything to incorporate, include uh, people from all backgrounds. I mean, you look at the things that we try to do. Uh, the happy Hong Kong. We never differentiate. And even when we to show the consumption vouchers, we try to be as inclusive as possible. So that is inclusiveness. That is embracing people from different culture, bit different backgrounds, different religion. And uh, we have been talking about uh, doing more about different, uh, well, for example, uh, ethnic minorities. We need to do more, but of course, there's never the best, only the better. We can only do uh, more and more every day. And there's no end game because we need to keep engaging. This is a family for everybody. That is what I say. On the topic of happy Hong Kong, a root cause of deep unhappiness in Hong Kong is the housing situation. I'm one of those who feels very unhappy about uh, what's happening with housing. So I've asked you this before, uh, and that was a year ago, and you've had a year to take stock. I'm asking you again, are you going to be the chief executive who's going to finally solve Hong Kong's uh, housing problem or at least lay the groundwork, solid foundation,
for future chief executives, possibly after your second term, to take stock and then to actually solve this problem? Because this is a core problem in Hong Kong. It is. It is a problem which is uh, not good for Hong Kong. It has to be addressed seriously. It is a problem that has been built up over the years. So I'm a pragmatic person. I don't want to make empty promises. And uh, when I uh, tell people that I'm to do things, then t first of all, a good analysis of the problem is important. And uh, then the obvious uh, common uh, solution uh, that anybody can propose is uh, have a bigger provision of uh, houses. Uh, you have bigger number of uh, houses to be produced, so, so when well actually the supply exceeds the demand, there should be no such problem. Well, that's an obvious uh, statement. You, you have answered my question, it? see. Are you going to be the guy to do it? I will be serious with you know, on it, but I also have to be pragmatic as to how we can go about it. First of all, I think uh, the direction of providing more houses is an obvious one. This is what I'm doing now. And I'm not just providing long-term housing, I'm also providing short-term housing uh, to alleviate uh, serious uh, pains of those people who will take long years to wait for their turn to, go, to get into a public housing unit. So that's why I introduced the live public housing uh, scheme. Uh, but of course, the long term is to provide as many houses as possible so that we will actually uh, answer to all the demands. In the long term, if you look at 10 years, then we will have more than sufficient uh, houses because the long term housing strategies have already identified the need for building uh, 300,000 public housing units. So I'm asking for people to increase in speed, increase in efficiency, and also try to increase in quantity as well. The second thing is, um, if we have sufficient land, we have sufficient houses supply in terms of number, then quality of life is important. So that means bigger houses, better environment. Well, that's very long term, you would say. Eh? Uh, how to address just the specific, the specific problem of people living in undesirable condition. I have been discussing with my team, the, the, those in the Housing Bureau and uh, those in the Development Bureau and also uh, the officials in the uh, financial side because anything we do, we need money. So we are looking uh, at how uh, this uh, can be addressed. Uh, and we need that study first. We need to examine how we will uh, define an undesirable accommodation, first of all, because even for what we, got, what we have termed as subdivided flats, the- You have a deadline to get rid of it. You only, you know, you only have about 25, uh, 26 years. Uh, the Hong Kong, uh, Beijing's top official in charge of Hong Kong affairs has literally set a deadline. Do you think the city can meet that deadline? 100,000, more than 100,000 people living in appalling conditions in shoebox homes. We should do our best. We have to look at the problem and see what are the priorities, right? We have to, first of all, look at uh, the whole problem to see, uh, first of all, how we're going to do it, what are the possible ways to do it, and uh, what are the priorities to be set. Obviously, for a problem that has been accumulated over, over 25 years, uh, need to be addressed, but we need to, uh, we don't overestimate uh, or underestimate the challenges here. I mean, there are a lot of challenges, obviously, uh, because while we want to help the subdivided flats, a lot of them are in the queue for the public housing estates. Some may not, uh, may not be qualified. So uh, it is important that uh, when we uh, pull out one block, uh, then other blocks remain intact. What about your own happiness? Uh, you, uh, we hear from your office that you've taken like two and a half days off in a full year of work. Uh, you're going to burn out at this rate. How do you do a work-life balance? Good question. Um, I am very conscious of the need of uh, keeping my own health in good condition. 
because I need to do things um, that are of importance for society. So I need to stay in a healthy condition. I need to have a fresh mind every now and then. I'm lucky, first of all, that I have strong support by my family members, my wife in particular, despite uh, the fact that I'm not uh, giving her uh, the time that she deserves, the family deserves. I feel guilty about it, but I thank them for supporting me. That is important because that takes away the uh, mental stress uh, that I somehow uh, need to get through because of the feeling that I'm not doing enough for my own family. Uh, I also keep myself in uh, the a good condition through practicing my Qigong, which I have been practicing for over 20 years. Uh, so Qigong is a more uh, peaceful form of martial arts. It's not the Bruce Lee stuff. That's what you're practicing. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. I'm, I'm not a Kung Fu man. <laughs> I'm, I'm more on the, the, the relaxation, the mental side, and also uh, strengthening the internal um, harmony. So is, that, is that your secret? I mean, you still have a full head of hair, it's still jet black. Uh, you don't seem as stressed out and worn out as the rest of us, so Qigong, is that the answer? I think it is one of the uh, important uh, reasons, but more importantly is the, um, is the meaningfulness of the job which drives me on. It's the important purpose and the significance value that I can hope to create for society, for the people of Hong Kong, that drives me on. I think that is important. And when I see progress are being made, despite the fact that I am asking for more progresses, and I believe we can make more progresses, that is the zeal that drives me on. All right, on that very positive note, uh, Chief Executive, thank you very much for your time and for sharing your wisdom as well. We wish you all the best. Thank you, Yonder. Thank you.